Hello, I'm John Neff, Global Editor-in-Chief of Motor One, and welcome to this week's edition of the MotorOne.com podcast. Almost 50 years ago to the day, the Apollo 11 mission landed on the moon and marked man's first footsteps on another celestial body. In the half century since, our exploration into space has continued, and automakers have actually been involved in some crucial and interesting ways. In honor of the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing, we're going to talk about the cool ways that car companies have inserted themselves into the space race since Neil and Buzz touched down at Tranquility Base on July 20th, 1969. Joining me is MotorOne.com writer and all things flying enthusiast, Christopher Smith. How are you, Chris? I'm flying, I'm buzzing, I'm ready to go. All right. Also with us is writer and wearer of interesting shirts, Chris Bruce. How are you doing, Chris? Doing great and happy to be back. I wanted to make this episode about the Apollo 11 moon landing because honestly, when I'm not working, writing about cars and and working on Motor One, uh, I've been thinking about this and I'm kind of excited for the anniversary. Chris Smith, I know you are, like I said, an enthusiast of all things flying. Has it entered your mind as well this week that it's coming up? Oh, you know, I mean, it's been on my mind for a long time. Um, I've I've had a long passion with aviation, uh, and especially on the military side and with space. And uh, but but I tell you, it sort of surprised me a little bit today. I've been so focused on the Corvette, the C8 reveal that's coming up, um, that it, it was. I realized today. Ooh, wait a minute. Saturday is the 50th anniversary of setting foot on the moon. So yeah, it's it's a, it's an exciting time. I'm I'm hoping that we can go back in a major way sometime soon. And I think a lot of people feel that way as well. And it feels like that's on the horizon. And I'm really happy, actually, you're on the episode today because last year you wrote an article about 10 amazing times automakers went into space uh, that we published on Motor One. And so what I wanted to do is kind of pull out some of the really cool ways that automakers have, you know, left Earth either with NASA or doing their own thing. I wanted to start with General Motors. Chris, you you wrote kind of um, extensively and you have a little background knowledge of a few of the ways GM has actually touched space exploration. And, and I would say they're probably the most uh, prolific when it comes to either assisting NASA or working together with them on something. You're certainly not wrong there. And it probably starts with the most famous real space car of them all, the Lunar Rover. A lot of people don't realize that GM was actually fairly involved with NASA on developing the Lunar Rover um, that went up to the moon for the final Apollo missions. I believe the first one was Apollo 15 in 1971 with Commander Dave Scott's uh, lunar module pilot James Irwin. They were the first ones to drive on another planet. And the rover, for what it was, I mean, it performed admirably. I think its top speed was somewhere around 10 or 12 miles per hour. It could carry two astronauts. And obviously, it allowed the astronauts to explore the lunar surface much, much further than they could have on foot. Even in lower gravity, where you can jump like Michael Jordan uh, from spot to spot, the lunar rover could go further, faster. And it was really key to really delivering some outstanding scientific content for those final uh, Apollo missions to the moon. You know, to me, it's it's mind boggling that at the end of the moon missions, we had the lunar rover. We actually had a car on the moon driving around, like you said, taking astronauts much farther away from the landing site than they'd ever been. And that's how we got, that's how far we got all the way back then. Imagine if we had never stopped going to the moon and what we would have there now. I mean, it would be fleets of cars for one thing. And yeah, that's a good point. When you think about it, this is what we were doing 50 years ago, 50 yeah. years ago. What could we do now? Every person listening to this right now has more computing power in their phone than the Apollo space capsules did. Exactly. You know, exactly. The technology has come so far, and you know, I think I think people are, uh, you know, people want to go back. Um, not just Americans, all around the world, people want to go back. People want to go exploring. That's sort of a basic human fundamental thing to go exploring. So, to the uh, to the government people listening, forget Area Fifty One. We don't need to storm Area Fifty One. Let's let's storm the moon. Let's go back. <laughs> I like the idea of storming the moon. I yes, like, I'm on board I like with that. Too. There was a lunar rover, but GM was involved in some other ways, too. Oh, yeah. Um, There are all kinds of of neat little things. Uh, I'm looking right now at a thing they had called the Robonaut. It was the GM Robonaut. And it's 
pretty much like it sounds. It's like a little humanoid kind of robot thing that they built, and it actually went up to the International Space Station on the uh, Space Shuttle Discovery back in, in 2011. Um, yeah, this thing is like a, it's a very humanoid robot. Yeah. And I think it's only like from the torso up, like it's not right. like a full, like, you know, full body one. But I mean, it looks like a dude in a spacesuit, kind of. Um, it's, it's sort of like, I mean, paint him, paint him red with a little bit of gold. And I mean, it's like Iron Man. Oh, he looks exactly like Iron Man. Yeah. <laughs> he also, I know he also, uh, I don't know, um, they also developed a set of gloves for the astronauts right. that were called Robo Gloves. Right. Yep. They were called Robo Gloves, a battery powered glove. They were able to sense pressure exerted by its wearer and uh, and it added strength also. It, it basically increased your uh, uh, your your muscle capability. So, when, I mean, that is uh, Stark tech. That is it, Iron Man tech right it, there. It, it totally is. Right. And I mean, right. this is something that we're not talking science fiction this is stuff that's been done already and been used already and when you think of general motors you certainly don't think of these things but gm has had such a big role in the in going into space i wonder because that was that was almost 10 years ago now i wonder if robonaut is still up there just kind of like shoved in a corner of the space station (laughs) or if they sent him back down with a load (laughs) at some point he's he's just up there being bored you know but but you know what else john these are things that we know about it kind of makes you wonder what's out there that we don't know about. Oh, oh absolutely. I love thinking about that. Oh, it's my favorite topic. <laughs> so did you guys, um, this is a little not automotive related, uh, but I want to bring it up because I just saw it recently. There's a, um, like a, a top secret space shuttle. And I think it's being developed by Boeing, but you know, one of the major defense contractors and, its existence isn't confirmed, but amateur photographers have caught it orbiting around the Earth, and it's been up there for a while. Oh, is this the Tic Tac? It might be. I don't know. I don't know that there was a name for it, but I just saw Well, it I think that's just like, because it kind of looks like a Tic Tac flying around. Is that's? What... I think you're talking about the uh, X-37. Yeah. Yep. The, uh, the X-37, it's an unmanned... Yeah, the um, unmanned shuttle. It's an unmanned... Well, shuttle type. I mean, it's not. It doesn't look like the space shuttle, but it. Ha- it doesn't. Similar, but it has. It it's has a lot that, of cargo. Uh, right, right. It's similar in that it's a it's a lifting body that uh, that can go up into space. And yeah, nobody really knows what it does. I mean, it's uh, it's it's yeah. Well, we'll just we'll just leave it at that because I don't want people knocking on my door. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of of like automakers working with um, NASA or with uh, the Pentagon, um, Chrysler is another automaker, I would say, right behind GM that had a, really a huge uh, contribution to make to the early space race. Not so much the recent stuff like GM, but um, Chrysler, you know, a lot of the big manufacturers back in the day after World War II were uh, either developing or manufacturing missiles. And Chrysler was actually worked on um, a couple of the first Saturn missiles, the Saturn 1 and the Saturn 1B launch vehicle rockets. And these weren't the the Saturn uh, 5 rocket that actually took um, the astronauts up to the moon, but they were earlier rockets that were still extremely large, and they they were d- used for a lot of testing that led up to the to the Saturn V rocket. Um, so Chrysler did a, tons of work on that and manufactured uh, some of those Saturn rockets. And I just read this recently. Chrysler also developed and designed an actual space shuttle in 1969, and they submitted it to NASA for like review and approval to be the, the you know to contract it to be contracted to build the next space shuttle. And it, I guess it was a pretty weird vehicle. It was a lot more like the current uh, SpaceX rockets, where instead of kind of falling back down to Earth, they would do a controlled descent with a bunch of rockets to slow it down. Uh, and again, this was back in nineteen, which is insane. To, yeah, I was about to say that. That is insane to think about in nineteen sixty nine. That it was insane to watch a few years ago when SpaceX did it for the first time. And to think that they were going to do it with like a huge shuttle, um, you know, back in 1969. And and what I read is that that's one of the reasons it was rejected was because uh, it was ahead of its time. They were they were supposing certain propulsion technology that didn't exist yet. Um, so it was ultimately rejected. But um, I loved that story. I just loved how, you know, how Chrysler was involved that way. I wish I wish they had stayed involved again. Like I wish all of this stuff had kept going and didn't didn't slow down. Uh, makes me happy, though, that we have Tesla and Elon Musk. Uh, you know, that's a good segue into what um, he's doing now. And of course, 
Elon's company SpaceX is not the same company as Tesla, but the lines between the two kind of blur sometimes. One example being that when Elon launched, uh, did the first launch of the Falcon Heavy rocket, which is their largest rocket to date, he put in its cargo hold the very first Tesla Roadster that was ever made, that was Elon's own personal car, and he put uh, his uh, spacesuit guy in it that SpaceX had designed the spacesuit for, and they launched it into space, and they just let this <laughs> this uh, Tesla Roadster, uh, I think it orbited the Earth once or something, or, or um, it stayed close for a little bit, and then it just went off into uh, the universe. And yeah, it, it, had a, it had sort of a Mars trajectory, and I will freely admit that I was in total nerd mode when oh. that when that went up. I, the the live stream that they had from the car. I mean, it was just mesmerizing, and it and it shouldn't have been because it's just like, oh, okay, here's a Tesla. But then occasionally the Earth would float into the background, and it's just like I'm looking at a car in space. Yeah, it's literally flying through space right now. You know, the, that, the, was, the, that that was such. Uh, I mean, it's not. It, it wasn't an experience, you know, like seeing the first space shuttle launch or like back with Apollo. But I think for the current generation, it was it was one of those inspirational moments where it's like we can do just about anything, people. It, I, I, I agree that it's not as significant as the original first launches. However, with that, with the decades break in kind of um, interest in space exploration uh, from the public, I felt like it was the first time in my lifetime where I, I recognized the moment that millions of people were suddenly inspired. And, and probably uh, many, many children um, started their first steps on path to careers in aeronautics, the space industry, stuff like that, because of that thing. And you're right, the presentation of it was flawless. Like when the cargo bay or the cargo hold like split apart. And uh, I think David Bowie started playing on the live stream. And like you said, the earth was just kind of rotating in and out of frame. And this car is going to be out there until it, you know, forever, unless it runs into something, but they're going to, you know, track where it goes. And it was such a good idea rather than just send the the Falcon Heavy up to make it into something so much more was was really, really cool. And and really, that's something that, you know, NASA could probably take a few lessons on. I mean, it's it's like the old uh, the, the movie, The Right Stuff. If you don't have any bucks, you don't have any Buck Rogers. It takes money to go into space. And part of that financial aspect is PR. If you have people excited about it, if you do something different about it, instead of sending up some ballast, hey, let's send up a, a red convertible with a dude dressed up in a spacesuit with something on the touchscreen that says, don't panic. You know, let's let's make it interesting. Let's make it exciting. That's going to fuel not just a, a new base of 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 scientists and explorers that want to go into space, but it's going to make other companies look at that and say, Hmm, I'd like to be a part of that. Maybe I should uh, offer up a little bit of a financial donation to, to be a part of that. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say whatever you think of Musk, he is nothing if not a wonderful carnival barker um, <laughs> yep. for the space That's industry. A good word for it. Yeah. And whether it be, you know, his own cars with Tesla or what he's doing with SpaceX, it's just he attracts a crowd to come and watch, um, which I think is, is amazing. And, and does the better. I mean, there are other billionaires investing in space like mm -hmm. um, Virgin Galactic and Jeff Bezos's company. Uh, but I, to be honest, I don't even know where those companies are at with their uh, progress. Whereas I know exactly where Tesla's at. I always watch when um, when they launch a shuttle to resupply the space station or to send satellites up. Because uh, it seems like every time they do, they're they're trying to take a step forward. They're trying to do something they didn't do before. Let's land three rockets. Let's let's land one uh, on a barge and two on land. You know, every time they're trying to do something they haven't done before. And it's yeah, it's it's, it's incredible to watch. It turns out Ford actually hasn't really done much with um, space exploration or NASA, they did have divisions back in the day working on um, missiles and weapon systems and communications, uh, but it never really dovetailed uh, like Chrysler's did from rockets or weapons into space. They kind of just, you know, stayed with uh, with just general aerospace. Um, Although the the other automaker that uh, and it's not really an automaker, but the other vehicle that comes to mind as being so iconic with um, 
with space and NASA is the Airstream Astrovan, yes. which is the the transport vehicle that they use to take the astronauts to the um, to the launch pad. Um, and there's been there's been two of them. There was an early one that the Apollo uh, team used, which was it almost looked like a milk truck, uh, but then they used. Um, an RV from Airstream, I think called the Excel that they outfitted for this. And it's got, you know, just like most Airstreams, it's got kind of the, um, the silver stainless steel, um, or aluminum, I'm sorry, um, skin. So it looks really cool. And that to me is, is an iconic vehicle and actually read that there had been plans to replace it. And the the rookie astronauts at the time were like, no, 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 we, it's tradition. We don't want to, we don't want to replace this. So, so they, they've used it for a really long time. Yeah, I'm looking at a photo of it right now. The massive air conditioners on top to keep yeah. things cool as I know it's it is absolutely icon- iconic for us space nerds. It, it doesn't get any better than that. Yeah, one of the coolest RV has ever made. Chris Bruce, you wrote some news, actually a very recent news, just like this week, the last yeah, week. Yeah. yesterday or day before. Yeah. And then it had to do with Toyota, which, mm-hmm. you know, again, you don't normally think of toyota and space or maybe you do uh, because they have popped up in in some weird ways but why don't you talk about the story you wrote about last week absolutely um so we actually heard about this last march when toyota and the japan aerospace exploration agency which is their version of nasa and they shortened to jaxa actually so that's easier to remember um but they signed a memorandum of understanding last march to kind of work on this deal and then this week it finally became official and so toyota and the japan space agency are going to work together to build what is in essence a motorhome on the moon right this yes. is like this is like the lunar rover from the 60s but or the 70s but an rv like a fully enclosed right it's like, fully enclosed it'll be pressurized inside it's still for two people but the kind of their plan for it is that astronauts be need to be able to stay in this thing for six weeks at a time so it you know this isn't just you know putter around for a little bit this is some serious time exploring the moon toyota's part in all of this is contributing their fuel cell technology um so toyota's gonna you know kind of use the stuff that's in the mirai i assume you know beef it up considerably since you don't want that failing at any time when you're on the moon and possibly take it into space, you know, possibly send it to the moon. The current plan is to have a full scale prototype ready by 2022. And then once you have the prototype, they need to figure out how to package it, you know, onto a rocket to get it to the moon, which is a little more tough. Yeah, you gotta, Um, it's gotta be like, you gotta fold it somehow or it's a little bigger than a Tesla. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, So (laughs) they want to have the packaged version ready by 2027. So from there, that could actually go to the moon. But they gave some preliminary kind of specs as to what they're going for. So it'd be uh, almost 20 feet long, six meters, uh, 17 feet wide and 12 feet tall, 12 and a half feet. Huge. Yeah, that's Uh, that's not small. Yeah. Um, And inside there would be 459 cubic feet, 13 cubic meters of room. So, yeah, that's 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 like a tiny house. Yeah, it's like a what I mean, that's the thing. If you would want some room to live in there, if you're going to be in there for six weeks, leave it to Neff to bring up tiny house. I know. That's that's awesome. Awesome. I'll tell you what. When I saw the renderings of this thing, the first thing I thought of was the movie The Martian and the vehicle. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That Matt Damon drives around in. Yeah. Um, There's a lot of similarities there. Yeah, it looks a lot like that. And you know what? The, the grill, I'm looking at a photo right now. That looks an awful lot like an FGA Cruiser, don't you think? It sure does. Up front? Yeah. <laughs> well it done, sure Toyota. I, I mentioned a little a little before you started uh, that Toyota has dabbled in space before, but in some fun ways. Yeah, um, this is more. So I am less a real world space fan and more of a sci-fi fictional space fan. And Toyota has a lot more experience there than a lot of other companies, especially with Lexus. I, I think there's someone at Lexus who just really likes sci-fi and keeps making sure their stuff gets put into movies. Um, so the most recent one is from uh, the latest Men in Black movie. And in that, they have an RC that turns into, here, let me get the name right, the Lexus QZ618 Galactic Enforcer, <laughs> which is this giant kind of fishy, weird looking thing to span the galaxy. Um, and I think I sent you guys a picture of it so you can see what it looks like. What are, what are your thoughts? 
it's wild. I mean, I think there's someone there who's just really into space and they like doing this stuff because it seems like Lexus will hand out their licensing to anyone making a sci-fi movie right. um, to, to, you know, to have fun just designing these uh, kind of one-off spaceships. Uh, yeah, because actually they did it last year, too. There was the it was kind of a forgotten movie, Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets. I'm not sure anyone actually <laughs> saw that movie. I, I got but halfway you, through it. <laughs> I if got you did, there. there is a Lexus branded spaceship in it. And they they touted it last year. They're like, oh, we're going to be in this big blockbuster movie. It wasn't. But they still have this Lexus spaceship. And then obviously, if you remember way, well, not way back, but several years ago, they were in Minority Report as well. So, yeah, someone at Lexus, I think, just really likes sci fi. And just whenever the opportunity comes up, you know. You can Don't get take a, it. A, a sci-fi Lexus in a movie somewhere. I really, I really like the Men in Black one because <laughs> it the, the spaceship maintains the giant Lexus spindle grill oh, in the yeah. front. Oh, no. And it, it, even ha- it even has a little F-Sport badge on the wing. <laughs> so I love oh, that I never even like noticed that. You're right. Yeah, I've looked at this thing F-Sport several badge. times. That's the first time I've seen it. That, the, you can actually make out the car door on the side <laughs> as yeah. well. Yep. Yeah. That's the one thing that uh, makes me sad for the future is if Lexus will still have this stupid spindle grill. Sorry, folks. Yeah, I'm, on their, I'm, on their I'm, spaceships. I'm, I'm not a fan. Not a fan. Yeah. I actually like uh, the Skyjet a little bit better, I think, than the uh, than the Men in Black. Yeah, it, it's a little slicker. Yeah. Um, well, like I said, this it's this um, Saturday, uh, which is right after uh, this podcast uh, will be published. I'm going to be probably sitting on my couch watching a lot of documentaries uh, on cable channels about the moon landing. Um so I imagine you guys will, will well, well, at least you, uh, Smith, will be <laughs> probably doing the same thing. Yeah, and I, I, I think um, I'm, I'm trying to remember. I mean, there's supposed to be some real time broadcast or rebroadcast of uh, of, the, of the descent down to the surface and the touchdown. And yeah, they, really. they're also interesting to watch. Uh, projecting the launch onto the Washington Monument right now. So like I, the I saw the whole that. rocket. Yeah. Yeah, the the Saturn V, the whole thing was projected on the Washington Monument. It looked looked fantastic. And I guess it's gonna it's gonna blast off probably at the you know the same time it blasted off uh, fifty years ago. Well, well, uh, the, the rocket already blasted off at this point. Oh yeah, yeah. Man. So the, I think the, they're just the gonna the do it on landing, Saturday. Yeah, the moon landing is on Saturday. That's right. That's right. They would have already been in space for a long yep. time by now. Um, all right. Well, the other thing happening um, this week that we spent the entire episode last week on was the C8 Corvette. And we got actually a few great comments from people um, who listened to the podcast last week. So we want to start a new thing where we share some of the best comments from listeners. This first one is from Jonathan Brown. And he says, can't wait for the official C8 reveal. Great show, guys. We at midenginecorvetteforum.com appreciate your excellence and coverage on the Corvette. And we actually appreciate uh, them because <laughs> we've right. found a lot of great stuff on your forum uh, that we have used as the basis for, you know, dozens of articles on Motor One. A um, lot of the renderings yeah. that we've seen have been developed by guys there at the forum. And Shout out to Chaz Cron. He, uh, you're a talented dude. FVS, Chaz Cron, absolutely. And uh, and we certainly appreciate you guys sharing your talents with us. And as we touched on last week, I mean, these aren't some, you know, kind of quick and dirty fan renderings. I mean, these guys made even walk around videos of a convertible C8 with the top going down while you're walking around. I mean, come on. That's, yeah, that's Hollywood the- stuff right there. Like 3D augmented reality videos is amazing. All right. Well, the second comment is from Doment Fly, and I'm going to read it word for word. So forgive me if it sounds a little strange. I'm all balls out for mid-engine, and it made sense for GM to go that route. One of them reasons is very likely due to the fact that C9 will likely be 100% electric just to transition the shape and form of the Corvette's future. They better have ECUs tunable because I'm salivating about the idea of sub 100,000 LS twin turbo with some mirror image precision T4 bolt-ons. Fireball spitting budget Hennessy Venom. Imagine what this platform will do to kit car world. The new transaxle will be used in many home builds. Exciting times. Finally, so. the Fiero can get a break. <laughs> I like this guy's optimism. <laughs> we can um, now build Countach's on the C8 Corvette. You heard it here first. That's not a bad idea, honestly. Uh, it'll, it'll happen. In 20 years, once they're cheap and in every <laughs> pick apart around the country. Well, speaking speaking of price, the next comment is from JC, and he simply says, not going to be a $65,000 car. And I happen to agree completely with JC. I think we're looking at a bump in base price 
I'm I'm gonna guess right now it's gonna be above eighty. You think um, above eighty? I think above eighty. Yeah. See, eighty is my number. That's your number? Yeah. I'm, I'm so you think they're gonna be like seventy nine ninety nine to start? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna shoot between seventy and eighty just because. GM's going to run a little bit of a risk here if they go too far up of, of really alienating some Corvette buyers that might already be a little bit alienated because the engine's moving behind them. I know. Yeah, I was looking today. Right now, a base base Corvette is basically 56. Yep. Jeez. So, you know, so even I'm, moving up to 80 is a good chunk of change more. It's huge. So, but, but if you're at 70, I bet a lot of those guys that are looking at the base base Corvette they're not going to buy the base base Corvette anyway. Sure. If they I can do 56 K they can do 60 or, or maybe 65 K. So really if you're at 70 K for a C eight, you're only going to be stepping up a little bit more and then GM can still sell. It has, you know, the performance bang for the buck that you won't find anywhere else. Yeah. There's not really going to be another mid engine car like that. I mean, maybe you could argue an alpha four C, but that's not really comparable right. once you start looking at anything. So if, if she, if GM can get this thing out the door at 70 K, it's going to be the performance bargain of the decade, the century. I don't know. And I'm, I'm putting my money down that they're not going to be able to do that. I'm, I'm putting my money down that someone in the company is going to get their way and it's going to be more, it's going to be more than 70,000. And I think it's going to be either like 79, 995, or it's just going to be at 80 or, or, or above. And really it, at 80,000, I mean, that's not a small It's still not a bad deal. It's yeah. Right, it's not a bad deal at all. The last comment is from Blake S. And he writes, love the podcast, guys. Was actually more interested in the Kia Soul GT than the overpriced automatic-only Corvette. Ha <laughs> ha. Oh, Blake, <laughs> you need to go drive the Kia Soul GT. You, you won't be more interested then. Yeah, you know, I haven't driven the... I, I've driven the X-Line, and I liked it. But I haven't driven the, the Kia Soul GT. I did just drive the um, Hyundai Kona, though. And I think they share um, the same... A similar engine and the same transmission. And I really did not like the transmission because it's it's a, a dual-clutch transmission that was very clunky um, starting really? from a stop and and shifting from reverse to, to, um, to drive. I, I guess um, I didn't use it starting from a stop, but um, I, I rather like the dual-clutch in the Kia and I should say that it's not not interesting but it's not 30,000 interesting don't get me wrong Smith you are a fan of the Kia Soul in general right. it's just the GT model that you're cool on correct I would be cool at 25 but not okay. at 30 it, it, there's just okay. not enough of a performance difference to justify and Fair. and you can get a GT line at, uh, at 25 but it doesn't have the turbo engine and and if I'm or a lot of other options right right and if, if I'm if I'm going to go that low I'm just going to stick with the X line because I like the looks of it better honestly the um, the Hyundai Kona that I did drive was also loaded um, and it was 28,680 um, and this was not a perform like it wasn't a performance version like the Kia Soul GT Turbo um, it was just really expensive <laughs> so We'd love to hear what everyone out there um, thinks about what we're talking about. Uh, specifically, I'd like to hear um, everybody's thoughts on the Apollo 11 moon landing. How interested are you in it? What do you did we forget any really cool connections between automakers and uh, space exploration? Um, I, you guys, uh, readers all and listeners always come up with great stuff that <laughs> are we're, we're blind to for whatever reason that we miss. Um, so please let us know either in the comments on Motor One for the podcast post or you can find us on uh, Facebook and Twitter at Motor One Com. Coming up, we'll find out what we've all been driving this week. Uh, before the break, though, as always, I wanted to remind everyone listening that you can also get our show on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Uh, so please hit that subscribe button. And if you can, leave a review of the show. Welcome back. Uh, during this part of the show, we talk about what cars we're driving this week. And today we're going to start with you, Bruce. Uh, what are you driving this week? So no press cars here, but I do have my 2012 Subaru Outback. And by mine, I mean my wife's. <laughs> um, we use it all the time. And we've recently been taking a lot of road trips around Ohio. And I have to say, despite being an older car, like, I, you know, I guess a 2012 is an older car. 
it's fantastic for what it does. Like it is a great dog hauler. We go. So I'm in the north northwestern corner of Ohio. Um, I frequently go down to Columbus. I frequently go down to the Zanesville area. I've been going to Akron. We've just had a lot of busyness in the family recently. And we have a dog and we do have a dog sling, you know, so it, it mm-hmm. keeps him off the seats, but he can also jump onto the center console and stuff. And it's just fantastic for that. Like it's smooth. It's, it's comfortable. It's great. What's got- your, what's your engine transmission combo? Uh, it's the 2.5 and it's a CVT. I have a friend who also has a 2012 Outback and he got the manual. Um, really? Which is super curious, but he loves it and still, you know, he's still driving it. He's talked about getting rid of it, but he never does. Uh, and I think that's for the same reason. They're just one of the most versatile vehicles uh, I, I can I do think have of. to say, though, my wife's eye is starting to wander towards the new Outback that, you know, we just got pricing for this week. Uh, she would want a limited XT, so right about thirty six grand. Woo, okay, <laughs> that's, a, that's the nice one. I, yeah, that's a step down from the top of the line. Yeah, um, but you know, so well, we'll Sup- Subaru doesn't care if she sells it as long as she stays in the family and gets another one. Yeah, well, but no, I, I honestly, I I love our Outback. It does everything I need it to do. It, on, where it excels best is as the dog hauler because you know you can put up a sling or anything, put put it up in the back, and he just rolls around in the back and he's comfy. Um, I'll be taking it to Akron this weekend and going to the Pittsburgh Vintage Grand Prix. So if anyone here is is listening to this on Friday, it's Saturday and Sunday. It's definitely a lot of fun to check out. Is Subaru now the kind of unofficial car company for dog lovers? It used to be Honda, but I feel like it switched to Subaru now. Yeah, I kind of think it. See, I used to think it was Volvo personally, but I think Subaru has kind of taken over that. That well, color. Honda actually had like a dog, dog lovers edition of the um, element. Yeah, the element. Yeah, uh, that was very highly valued. Like I've never I don't think I've ever seen one um, up for sale used. Uh, but I know then right now Subaru has those commercials where the dogs are in it mm-hmm. uh, driving, driving the vehicles. So I know I know there's some affinity between dog lovers and, and Subaru owners right now. I'm actually looking at a picture of the new. Uh, the brand new um, redesigned Subaru Outback, and it's in like this olive green yeah. with black cladding that and black wheels. Oh, it looks killer! Yeah. It looks like a, it looks like a military vehicle. They're good looking. It, yeah, they it's good looking. Have so we'll see what happens. It. And you know that's the nice thing about Subaru. So many cars you buy brand new and you take a big depreciation hit. You'll still take yeah. that depreciation hit with Subaru. Oh yeah, that's but they hold thing. their value just like nothing else out there. Right Look very now. well. How about you, Smith? What, what have you been driving this week? Well, you know, I've been test driving the Kias. I haven't uh, done any test drives recently. I did take a trip recently in my 95 Mustang GT, just a little road trip out to Devil's Tower, made famous in the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kinds. There's the space reference for uh, for our topic today. You know, on that drive, it just it, it reminded me, you know, it, it's it's not the greatest car ever built, but right now you can get an SN95 Mustang in really good shape for probably $5,000 or less. And yeah, if, their budget's really and, good and, right now. Yeah, and that's going to be that's as low as they're going to go. And mm-hmm. I suspect that those prices are going to start to go up because that was kind of where the Mustang started to get a little bit of its retro feel back um, with that styling. And, you know, it, it, it's a good entry-level place to jump in. I Actually, though, I, I want to talk about something a little different and a little... Okay, a lot out of the ordinary, because um, like many listeners out there, I suspect I'm an avid gamer and uh, I have a nice little cockpit set up with my force feedback wheel with the six speed manual shifter um, hooked up to an Xbox One X. And I was playing Dirt Rally 2.0, which we actually reviewed about three or four months ago, I think, when the game first came out. If you're a rally fan, I mean, it's a hardcore rally sim. It really is. And I only recently just started trying the Group B cars. And the Group B rally cars. The the, the Group B rally cars. Uh, Of course, we're talking about the cars, you know, the killer bees from the 80s that were five and 600 horsepower that could go zero to 60 in like two and a half seconds on dirt. Spinning, throwing up rooster tails. I've never driven an actual Group B car, and I'm sure just about everybody listening probably hasn't. Just trying this on my racing sim, and it's still, as good as it is, it's still just a game. It it just blows my mind at the skill 
that is required to handle one of those cars. I can't even fathom trying to drive one like you see on the on the video reels from the 80s. These just absolute legends in rally taking these cars just to the brink and back and somehow still managing to cross the finish line. Um, when you can accelerate that hard, when you just flip the gas and all of a sudden you're up to 70, 80 miles an hour. Um, so which one specifically are you? What's your weapon of choice in uh, dirt? I kind of like the RS 200 like a lot of people do. Oh, of um, course. Okay. Yeah. The, the, One of my favorites. I've, I've, been driving, I've been driving the Audi. I'll, I'll just come right out and say it. Okay, it, the Sport Quattro? Yeah, it, I mean, it's... Don't hate me, Audi fans. It's kind of a pig. It doesn't handle really that well. But that inline five sound and just the way that car hits, it's just the 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 feel is amazing. And again, I'm still I'm just talking about a sim mm-hmm. to, to get into one of those cars, you know, the, the real deal and head out on a stage somewhere. It just it, it gives me a new appreciation watching these old rally clips for the driver and especially the co-driver sitting next to him, not in control of anything. Oh, I, there's no way I could do that. There's you know, no we way. just, we recently had the Goodwood Hill climb and that's one of the reasons I love that event so much because, um, a lot, you know, there were groupie rally cars there, yeah. um, going up the hill climb. And it's like exactly what you said. It's unbelievable to see these, these machines that were bonkers in the day. They were so bonkers that they were basically just outlawed almost oh, yeah. as quickly as they, as they were approved. And I just love that they still exist. Um, they still get to go out and stretch their legs every once in a while at events like, uh, like the Goodwood Hill climb. Um, and now you also recently upgraded, uh, your, uh, console system. I did to, to an Xbox One X, so probably the experience was just a smidge more visceral for you as well. Well, when I when I initially reviewed the game, I was a little critical of the graphics. Um, they weren't bad, but they had uh, they had a softer feel than I was expecting. I was running an Xbox One S. That's the uh, that's the older model. Um, it's mm-hmm. 4K compatible, but it upscales. It it wouldn't uh, output graphics in true 4K high dynamic right, range. Right, right. The X does, and I have to say. It's it's made Dirt Rally Two just a completely different experience now, hmm. and uh, and right. maybe I shouldn't have have dove into Group B with uh with, with being my first uh, HDR experience on the Xbox, but it just I I needed to point it out because it uh, it no, just no, gave no, me that... a new appreciation for those drivers and and even the current drivers. Um, you know when you're still running 300 horsepower, it's it's a just a completely different level. I'm obviously a big rally fanboy, and I I like to convince myself that you know what, maybe ten years ago I could have gotten into this, but uh, it's it's just a completely different level of driving, and this experience has given me a whole new appreciation for Group B. No, that was that was uh, really fun for you to mention. I think going forward, we'll open up uh, the what we're driving segment to include <laughs> uh, video game cars, uh, radio controlled cars, models, <laughs> oh, and uh, I'm just going to throw in Lego as well. So, so that's so. In other words, this is going to be you, me, and Bruce talking about this every week. Oh yeah, I could talk about models forever. <laughs> we'll just talk about we'll just talk about our toys uh, and, for 45 minutes each week. And we went to the nerd zone. I'm cool. I'm cool with that. <laughs> All right, let me, with that. Let, me, let me bring us back because um, I drove a real car last week. Well, actually, I have it right now. It's the 2020 Kia Telluride, uh, okay. which is the new three-row full-size uh, crossover SUV from Kia. And I, th- this has been a critical darling. Like every review, uh, every first drive I've read, every review, uh, the ones that we've done have just been so positive on this vehicle. And, um, you know, I'm I'm pretty up on Kia. Like I like Kia vehicles, but I was hearing so many good things. I was starting to think like there's no way this thing will live up to uh, my expectations. And uh, so I, I got it uh, yesterday and I have done my inaugural uh, trip to the grocery with it and put some miles on it. Um, and it kind of does live up to the expectations. Right. Like the, the, first of all, the design is excellent. It's a little, it's boxy, but in a mm-hmm. really cool way. Um, it actually sits kind of low, like lower than you expect. And I know this is going to sound weird, but when I walked up to it, it kind of smacked of Bentley Bentayga in, in its, in its presentation from, from a profile view, a pretty big compliment for, yeah. you know, what is essentially yeah, a price. 40, $47,000 SUV compared to a, you know, $240,000 SUV. Um, the interior is also excellent. I mean, it, it's like it's like a Kia Plus interior. Mm-hmm. Take take everything that's in all the Kias you know and make it a little nicer. Like the screen's a little nicer, a little bigger, a little better graphics, a little faster. Um, the materials.
materials. There's some nice um, kind of matte wood uh, trim on it that's really nice. It's just like uh, like a little bit extra uh, compared to like your your Optima or or your Soul or something like that. And it drives really well uh, so far too. Um, and not much to report there. It's got a, a pretty large 3.8 liter six cylinder engine, eight speed automatic. Um, it's riding on 18 inch wheels. So everything's pretty pretty standard so far in terms of the, the ride and handling. I'm pretty excited to get in the back seats, though. And if I can, ferry some people around and stick them in the third row and see what they think. How do you feel so about the So have you power? driven a Palisade yet? Uh, I have not driven a Palisade. I'm just uh, curious because it seems like, like you said, the Telluride has been a critical darling. And it didn't seem like the Palisade got that praise. And at least on paper, they're very, you know, they're they're very, very similar. So I'm just wondering what it is that the Kia is doing that the Hyundai isn't. Honestly, I think it has most to do with presentation. I think it's the design and the material choices and things like that. I think the uh, Palisade has a little bit more um, traditional um, three row crossover look to it. And the Telluride is a little bit more, like I said, boxy and more butch a little bit, which, you know, goes over well with people who want to drop the minivan stigma. Um, and I think the the Palisade has a little bit more of a uh, a normal or traditional look that, you know, kind of looks like, you know, your Honda pilots, your, you know, you know, your Subaru Ascents, things like that. Um, but you're right. I, and the, the Palisade just kind of came second. You're right. So the, the Telluride landed on the scene first. Um, uh, auto journalists got to drive it first. Um, so I think, you know, when the Palisade came around, all, all of our, um, you know, praise has had already been spent on the on the Telluride. I do like the way the the Kia looks versus the Palisade, but I was wondering, John, uh, what you thought about the power in the uh, in the Telluride. Is, is is it is it adequate for for something that large? Oh yeah, I, I would definitely say adequate. I would say in my limited time driving it, I haven't uh, like punched it yet to see what it can really do. But it, yeah, usually when I get in and even just driving around doing my errands and stuff, I can tell if something feels underpowered. And this does not feel underpowered. This feels it, it's it's more than adequate. Um, doesn't ever feel like it's wheezing or 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 anything like that. Uh, and the the NVH levels, the noise, vibration, and harshness levels are. are very good as well um so look this is the three row crossovers one of the most competitive segments right now right uh in the entire automotive industry it's like full-size pickups and then three row crossovers in, in terms of competitiveness and maybe compact crossovers too um so you know saying the tell your tell your ride is great is is one thing but there are lots of great uh three row suvs they're they're being made at a very high level right now so can uh, i ask you to compare apples to Let's call them pairs for a second. So I know you recently had a BMW X7, also a three-row crossover. Yeah. Compare the Telluride and the X7. Sure. Okay. So that's, that's great because the X7 was $112,000 oh. mm-hmm. and it had a twin turbo 4.4 liter V8 mm-hmm. um, somewhere in the neighborhood of like 450 horsepower or something like that. Uh, the Telluri- Telluride is $46,800. So you know, ma- almost three times the price uh, right. that the X7 is to the Telluride. Uh, what I can say is that the X7, in terms of design, was a letdown. Uh, it's got the enormous BMW kidney grill, which is just ostentatious. And then the rest of it is just boring. As a matter of fact, I just wrote the review for it and I compared the X7, everything from the B pillar or no, everything from the A pillar backwards might could, could be a Cadillac XT6 and you wouldn't know. It's just bland and forgettable. Um, so I, I would pick the Kia over the BMW in terms of design uh, all day long. Um, obviously, in terms of like uh, in terms of power and handling the X7, right, that's yeah. not really f- going to be a fair. F- I just kind of meant like interior. You were you were giving the interior of the Kia a lot of praise. So I was just kind of curious. So, well, well, let me let me let me say that. Well, let me let me finish what I was going to say on the power. So, yeah, the BMW, obviously way more powerful. The X7 was one of the best handling crossover SUVs I've ever driven, um, regardless of size, like even as big as it is, it was it was legit fun to drive. Uh, and the Telluride, as far as I can see right now, is not like that. It's just like a normal I'm going to make you comfortable kind of vehicle in terms of interior. Um, 
Man, that's hard because the X7 was was dolled out. It had mm-hmm. the glass package, which which that makes the shifter and um, the iDrive controller and the start button this kind of clear crystal glass. Um, so it was it was fully decked out. I would say I'll give the Kia this. It was closer in kind of quality and impression um, to the X7 than its pricing suggested like you definitely feel like the kia like i said it's like a kia plus it's more premium than you expect so um i i would put it closer to the x7 than i think the the difference in price suggests but it did the x7 was it, it, you could tell it was a hundred and twelve thousand dollar vehicle from the inside as a matter of fact this is just for um podcast listeners it received a 7.4 out of 10 star rating from jeff uh jeff perez who reviewed it and that's one of the highest scores we've given we have a very difficult (laughs) scoring system to score high um so getting anywhere in the seven seven star range is very good and the telluride got a 7.4 so so you can look forward to reading that review pretty soon all right, so that brings us to the end of our show. Uh, you can follow Chris Smith on Twitter at CH Writing. Uh, you can follow Chris Bruce at Chris Bruce 1985. And you can follow me at John underscore M underscore Neff. Uh, I want to thank uh, you guys, both of the Chris's, for joining me today. Always a pleasure. As fun as always. And I want to thank all of you out there for listening as well. We'll see you next week. 